Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We are in a series. Anybody knows what it's called? That's a bold statement, isn't it? It's a bold statement, but it's really about the spiritual authority, the calling and inheritance, as well as accessible resources we have as children of God. We've learned why we are to rule our world, because God said it. He said, fill it, bring it under subjection, have dominion, have authority, multiply it. And then he said in Romans 14 how to do it. Bring it in, bring the kingdom, and the kingdom, operate in the kingdom, and the kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy. If we're not in righteousness, peace, and joy, we are not implementing the kingdom. But that's how we are to rule. We rule with him, not like they did in Judges 17 where it said, and it says it throughout the whole book, that they had no king and they all did what was right in their own eyes. Amen. We need our king. And so we've been empowered to rule and reign with him forever. And so let's learn how to operate in this kingdom calling now. And I hope you know that we don't get up here saying and preaching these bold messages like this. Just to have something to blow people's minds with or to wow you with. This is really the way you're called to live. That's right, man. That's right. You're really called to live this way. And can I tell you, Christians for the most part have been settling for less. Come on. Been settling for less. We are called to rule our world. We are called to have dominion. We are called to be in control. Amen? Amen. God has given us this place for us to be in control of it. Right? we got to call it what it is. No, this is not taking place. We don't have to accept everything. Amen? Hallelujah. He has put us in control. If it don't, if it don't make it, it's because we, we messed up. A lot of people don't like to hear that because it really messes up their religion. God put us in control of this place. My God don't make hurricanes. There's an earth that does not know how hard the wind blows sometimes. Right? He does not take out innocent people. He does, not, he does not allow innocent children to die. Okay? Because too many people for too long have said, why God, why? Why did that tornado happen? The whole earth is travailing and it's waiting for its creator to come back. The earth has been out of whack ever since sin was welcomed yeah, into it. So the, the earth, the creation of earth is longing for him. You and I are longing for him. But he has given us a responsibility. And no, we can't stop hurricanes. We cannot. But we can sure take shelter. Come on. <laughs> we can build concrete shelters. He's given us the knowledge and the know-how to come back with anything that we can't control. And He's also given us the authority and the power to overcome the things we can control. Amen? Amen. He has the last word. Yes, but I am here to tell you, He gets involved, amen, when praises go up. He gets involved when we get Him involved. He gets involved when we call Him on the scene. And there's coming a day when He's ending all of this. Sin will be over. Death will be over, debauchery, uh, fornication, all the horrible things, uh, murdering children at record rates through abortion and all the terrible things that are happening in our world today. God's putting it all to an end. The only thing you and I got to do is get ready for Him to come and tell as many people about Him before He does come. Amen. I'm about to preach in this place and I'm trying to behave because I want to teach tonight, but I just wanted to kind of put that out there. That you are really hearing something. And I don't know what colleagues out there and people down the street are preaching. I, I don't. But I do know this is profound. And kingdom preaching, kingdom teaching is not something that a lot of people are preaching right now. And I think we have just, I don't want to say we've stumbled upon it because I've kind of been in this direction for a while. But I think we have something very profound and very unique to say here. Because I want people to get discipled off this. I want people to get stronger off this. I want people to get a firm foundation and be grounded in this. Amen? Amen. And so if anything I'm preaching these days is going over your head, uh, message me. Talk to me about it. But also, before you do that, before you talk to me, talk to Him. Amen. Because He can help you understand anything in this Word if you'll ask Him to guide you. Right. Amen? And He'll open it up to you. Alright, so to recap... This past uh, Sunday, 
We spoke of the anointing versus the, our ability. We only have an anointing because of his anointing. We don't have an anointing without him. And how we are called to rule our world, but not rule over others. Nobody's going to want to listen to anything about your Jesus if you're pounding them in the head with it. I've heard my pastor say before, people will want an ice cream cone as long as you've got one and you're licking it. But if you go with spirit in their face, they don't want nothing to do with your ice cream cone or you. And you might want to run. Unless you're ready to fight. Nobody wants it spirit in their face, right? And so that's the first time I've used the ice cream cone analogy, I think, Pastor Jerry. That's all right. Just go ahead, brother. Amen. Pass it on down. I'll, I'll pay you your royalties later, okay? But it's his love in us that draws people in. Amen. So we said ruling your world with your eyes off of Jesus is fruitless. Can I get an amen? amen. And that is what the rich young ruler in our main text did. This uh, past Sunday when we looked at it, I think we looked at it in the Gospel of Luke. He came to Jesus and what did he call him? He said, teacher. He called him by his earthly role. So he called him by his earthly flesh role. And so he got an earthly flesh response. He didn't call him Lord. He didn't even call him Rabbi Nye. He didn't call him priest. He didn't call him pastor. He just called him teacher. That's the same thing. Nothing wrong with being a teacher. That's a great thing. But that's the same thing that the Pharisees and the Sadducees called him. And see, if you're going to step out in faith, you're going to have to believe differently than what they believe. Because they didn't believe in him enough to even want him to live. They wanted to kill him. And so we've got to believe greater than that which is against what we believe. And he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Jesus told him to obey the commandments. He said, I've done that. Got it. Jesus didn't dispute it. He said, I've done it ever since I was little. I've got it. He said, but what do I still lack? And we told you that religion will always leave you that way. That when you are good at obeying the rules of religion and you've done all the right things and you've crossed all your T's and dotted all your I's, but you're still lacking. Religion will always leave you that way. But a relationship will never leave you Amen. that way. Amen. Because a relationship with Christ always fills the void that religion cannot fill. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. When your whole life is falling apart and you're down on your knees in the middle of the night, religion cannot help you. But a relationship right. with the one who made you can come into that room right then and give you hope and fill you full of joy and excitement when you are at the end of your road. Please don't call on religion. Call on the name above all names. Amen. Hallelujah. So we look at the rich young ruler from Luke's gospel as well as the tribe of Dan in Judges 18 and how they intermingled pagan idol worship with Judaism which was the worship of Jehovah, the worship of God, right? Because Jesus hadn't come yet, so there wasn't any Christianity in the Old Testament. But before there was Christianity, it derived from Judaism. And they intermingled pagan idol worship, and I believe they saw it as a harmless habit because they were still keeping up rituals, they were still honoring the name of God, but they were allowing pagan rituals in and intermingling it. And they even won battles that were possible for them to win. See, God shows up when there's, the battles are impossible That's for right. us to win. Yeah. If the battles are possible and easy, amen, God says you just have at it. Mm -hmm. But when it's impossible, that's when you need to call on God the most. Amen. That's when God is really going to show up. And they were winning battles and then after battles that they already had strategically looked and said, oh, we can whoop them. They won't even fight back. There's more of us than there are of them. They don't even have weapons. And so they would win those battles and then say that God was with them. They would win those battles, those easy battles, and say that God was with them. And I said, never allow personal success to be a measuring stick of whether or not you're pleasing God. The things you did on your own. Because that will be the same person that when something don't go their way, they'll say, why God, why? And they'll all of a sudden say, I don't need God, I don't need a preacher, I don't need a church, I don't need Christians. I made my own success. My hard work and busting my behind every day got me to where I am. I don't need nothing. And I remember a king named Nebuchadnezzar who said all those kinds of things. And within a matter of hours, he was on all fours eating grass off the ground. Like livestock. 
Be careful of, of your own personal accomplishments. Amen? And yes, we give God the glory in everything. But at the same time, when you're looking at something and you're not where you need to be with God, your heart is not right with God, and you've really not welcomed God into the situation, maybe you just want to get credit for being religious looking. That's what they got credit for. But also they had allowed harmless habits in. And harmless habits allowed in the small corners of our lives can become dominating forces. They can get out of control. And we said that anything that can take root in your life can take over your life. Because if it can take root, it can rule. And once it takes root, man, it is hard to get it out. So tonight I want to stay on this same vein right here. I want to stay on this same topic of how taking our eyes off of the Lord is fruitless in kingdom living and in kingdom reigning. Father, God, my words tonight, let them be your words, your thoughts. Lord God, I ask you to help us as we break down this scripture tonight and empower us, Lord God, to receive from on high in Jesus' holy name. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, now some additional points I want to mention before we get in that scripture. Jesus challenged that rich young ruler in the area of where he had put God on the back row. In the area of life that he had put over God or before God. You see, Jesus said, sell everything you owe. If you're still feeling a void, then take the next step. Don't just live right. Sacrifice everything you've got. Sell it to the poor. And follow me. Now, that was a lot to ask, but look what he was offering him. He was offering him a chance to be a legendary apostle that would establish churches, write epistles that would be recording in the Holy Bible, start churches, have churches named after you, all that. All the things that came with being an apostle. And they didn't do it for those reasons, but I mean, he was offering him a spot, but he couldn't see past what he had. And Jesus went right to the source of why he was feeling like it wanted up. He knew there was something he needed to do, but he couldn't cut it loose. There was something he needed to do because he realized there's something I had put before God. And Jesus went straight to it. It's all your stuff. All your stuff. All the things you have. All your riches that you have. Jesus was challenging him in the very area that he had put before God. And can I give you a teaching point tonight? Teaching point number one says this. Sooner or later, every Christian is challenged in the places of life they put before God. Yes. At some point, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, it might not even be this year. But at some point, God's going to challenge you in that place that you've put before Him. Whether it's your a relationship, whether it's your business, your career, your hobbies, whatever it is, He is going to challenge you in that place. I don't even need to get into all the areas and the, the drastic ways that that could play out. But here's the safe bet. So that you don't have to suffer any of those consequences. So that you don't have to deal with any of those challenges. How about just put the Lord first? Amen. Amen. I just put the Lord first. He wants us to have our vacations. He wants us to have things that we enjoy. I enjoy things. Amen. I enjoy fishing. <coughs> but I'm not going to miss church on Sunday to go fishing. Amen. Am I talking all right? Am I being too religious? Well, I mean, really. I can go after. Or I can get up real early and go before. Right? Amen. I love golf. But I'm not, come on somebody, I'm not going to play golf on Sunday. Now, if I was in the PGA or something like that, okay, I wouldn't even be up here, right? I would, and they play golf on Sunday, but I, I'm going to have some church in a tent somewhere. But I'm not in the PGA. I could pretty much say I'll never get there. It's not going to happen. I had said I'd be a par golfer by the time I was 40. I'm 44, and I'm still not a par golfer. It's just not in the cards for me. But I love to play, right? I love to play. Listen, for those that love to hunt, hunt all you want to, but don't put it before God. Amen? Don't go, listen, I, I'm going to say this, and maybe I'm an old fogey, but if you're going to go buy that, that $70,000 pickup truck, but say, you know what, I'm not going to pay my tithes, and I'm not going to help nobody, I'm not going to 
fund no missions and I'm not going to sow into the poor or da da da. I'm going to scale back on what I do for the kids this year at Christmas time. Something might be wrong there. Amen. Maybe you don't need a $70,000 truck. Maybe you need a, a $40,000 truck. Okay. Amen. I'm just saying, whatever you've been putting before God. Whatever you've been putting before God. Amen. And so sooner or later, Every Christian is challenged in the places of life that they've put before God, right? You may not have to necessarily give it up altogether, but we'll definitely have to put it in its proper place. We don't have to give up things we love. Amen? You're going you're gonna to miss church and you're going to, you know, you might not get up. Or you might decide to sleep in one morning. You didn't get to have a chance to have your regular Bible study or whatever. You're going to miss things from time to time. God wants you to rest. He wants you to enjoy your family. Amen. I can't do church all the time. I need to take my wife out on a date. Praise the Lord. Amen. But at the same time, God wants us to put these things in its proper place. Also, the rich young ruler asked, what must I do? Somebody say, what must I do? What must I do? What must I do? What kind of act can I perform? What kind of work can I do to get me in? And he says, what must I do? Do right here just it screams religion. It's not of works lest any man should boast. Right. Now, faith without works, though, is dead. We know that. I mean, we can't just sit on our hands and never do anything. But he is saying, what must I do to inherit there's nothing you can ever do to inherit. Inheriting something is not about anything you do. The inheritance I will get one day when my father goes to glory is not for anything that I will do or haven't done. It's simply because I'm his son. It's because of who I am, I get what he's going to leave me, right? And so you don't do anything to receive an inheritance. He asked a multifaceted question and got a multifaceted answer. To do, meaning, what can, can I do more with the law? Can I do more with the commandments? That's religion that's pulling that out of him. But second, inherit it, it, to inherit is a relationship that you have by simply trusting in and following Jesus Christ. The lack that he felt came from the longing, and the, uh, the longing for more that's instilled in us all. Can I tell you that every human being was made to long for God? Unsaved people don't realize what that emptiness is. An atheist doesn't realize what that emptiness is. A Muslim does not realize, come on somebody, what that emptiness is. They've been lied to and says you need to go and kill a non-believer. And you'll have 70 virgins waiting to marry you in the heaven you're going to. And so for that, they'll blow themselves up in a public place and kill innocent people to do it. That's how passionate they are. But they're missing something. That's right. Everybody was made to long for God. Yeah. And see, even when we get saved as a Christian, unless we tap into the presence of God, unless we pull in and say, I want more of God, not just church, not just religious services, not just, come on, a ritual and a tradition, unless we tap into who we really are before the foundations of the earth was formed, amen, we are still going to be empty. But when you get in here, if you will have a response, I said earlier this week on social media, don't ever let the presence of God come into a room and you just stand there with your arms folded like he ain't never done nothing for you. When he comes in the room, get your little religious arms up in the air and start praising your God. Lift your voice. I don't care how timid or shy you are. My God, he has done more for you than anybody. He offers every prayer. Well, I can't see blessings because I'm broke. I can't see blessings because I'm on the verge of bankruptcy. Can I tell you that blessings don't just form of dollar bills. Every single time I take a breath is a blessing. The fact that I'm not down in the nursing home right now staring at the seat is a blessing from God. We all to everybody in this room right now and if you're listening at home, you need to realize just how blessed you are. Don't let him come into a room and we don't honor him. Amen. Hallelujah. Last night was the State of the Union address. They stood in the aisleway 
Wright said, ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And people stood, most of them stood, shook hands as he come down the aisle. The leader of the free world is walking down the aisle. We'll do that for a man. And leaders are worthy of that. We need the Bible says to honor our leadership. Amen. But how can we stand in our churches on Sunday morning and the cool wind of the Holy Ghost blow through here and we stand there like a statue? My God, I'm not trying to put nobody down in this place, but he's been too good to me for me to just stand there. I got to give him praise and I don't care if it's too loud for you. I can't help it if it's too wild and crazy for you. I can't help it if I might just preach so hard I might accidentally spit on you. I can't help it. He's done too much for me to be quiet and be still, Sister Glass. I can't stay still about my Jesus. My God, if it weren't for Jesus, I'd be dead by now. They'd have already put me in the ground and I'd already be burning in eternal hell. But Jesus saw fit to raise me up, save my soul, and he allowed me to be able to preach this tremendous gospel. If you know how blessed you are, you ought to stand up in this little Bible study right now and give your God a mighty prayer. Hey. All right, all right. I'm sorry. Y'all blame Joy for that. Y'all blame Sister Joy for that. Got me all wrapped up. Got me all wrapped up. Can I tell you, today, when I thought about that song, I don't know nothing about anything. I saw joy testifying, preaching, and crying in my spirit. I already saw what happened a while ago. I saw it earlier this morning about 8 o'clock. God told me that that song was just going to pour out of her and she was going to want to, uh, she, he was going to give her a word. Amen? Amen. So that was mesmerizing for me a while ago. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Thank you, Jesus. We inherit out of a relationship. Right? Yes. Jesus was saying, if you want to cut religion out, come and join me, son. I want to offer you a chance at having a relationship with me so that you'll inherit everything that I want to give you. And I own the cattle of a thousand hills. Amen. I own it all. All that riches that you've got right now. That you've got on this earth. Don't compare to the mansions that my father has built in heaven. I want to offer you something like you would never ever even realize could be possible. Simply for having a relationship with me. Amen. I don't know about y'all. But I'd much rather have a relationship with Jesus. Alright. Let's get into that scripture we've been holding for a minute. 1 Samuel 15. Everybody feeling good? Yes. Mm. Hallelujah. No, I have not had any coffee. Yes. This is all God. Now, where we are in this portion of Scripture is after the long period of judges, Israel desires to have an appointed king like all other nations. And so God has Samuel, who's the last judge, and he's also the prophet for the nation at that time. He has Samuel anoint Saul as Israel's first king, who started out good with his eyes on God. But the more victorious he became, the further away he slipped. You have to be careful. There's so many people that start off good, Pastor Jimmy, with the Lord. But then they start to get successful. And they start to trust in their own might and their own ability and the appreciation that people are giving them then they start to think, you know what? I'm doing this. No, 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 no. God puts you there. God can keep you there. And God can take you out of there. Amen? He raises up and takes down kings. Amen? Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. He raises up and takes down kings. I know we vote in this country, but can I tell you that God raises up and takes down kings. Amen? Hallelujah. Not just in the Bible times, but to this day. Amen. Yeah, <clears throat> so, now here in verse 10, uh, King Saul was told to totally destroy his enemies, the Amalekites. And it was harsh. Destroy everything. Destroy every single one of them. 
I don't want no offspring or anything. They are demonic people. They throw babies into open campfires as a part of their worship. They are a, a, a people that I want to eradicate from the earth. If you don't, there'll always be a thorn in your side. So I'm counting on you, Saul, the first appointed uh, king of Israel to do this. So God told Samuel to tell him, get rid of everything they've got. But he kept their king as a trophy mm -hmm. along with their best animals. Yeah. And watch how he tries to, as he would say, front. <coughs> Meaning, he tries to con yes. the prophet who has talked to God. He tries to make himself sound religious and holy. Like the reason he kept those animals, we were going to have a sacrifice. We were going to have a sacrifice. That's the reason I kept the best animals. No, watch this. When you push and you show people where you stand, a lot of times the truth will come out. It says in verse 10, Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel saying, I greatly, this is what God's saying to Samuel, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. Don't sound like to me he's doing anything for God. He's setting up a monument for himself to celebrate this mighty victory he's got over this enemy nation. Mind you, he has kept the king. The king, I believe his name was Agag. Yeah. He kept him as a trophy. The Bible says he put a, a chain around him or either a hook in his yeah. nose and paraded him through town. Yes. Like, here's their king. That's right. And But God didn't say do that. God said get rid of him. Get rid of him. Eradicate him. Uh -huh. And so, it says then in verse 13, Samuel went to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? Where'd you get all them animals from? You're supposed to kill everything. What's all them oxen I hear? The sheep I hear. Bah. Ain't supposed to be none of this going on. See, all of their livestock was back at home. They were on the battlefield. They weren't supposed to have no sheep on the battlefield. They had took the spoils of the enemy, but God said, don't take the spoils. Kill the spoils. I'll provide for you. Watch this. And Saul said, they have brought them, verse 15, from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. He's supposed to be your God too, Saul. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel, in other words, I did part of it right. This, I mean, really, it sounds like a teenager that didn't clean up all his room. I, you know, I picked up my shoes off the floor, but I didn't vacuum. Or I vacuumed, but I didn't pick nothing up. I just vacuumed around it. <laughs> then Samuel said to Saul, be quiet. Samuel's getting tough here. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, speak on. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not the head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. He didn't say bring it back. He said kill him. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took up the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. There he goes again. Distancing himself from a relationship with God in Gilgal. Isn't it something when, you, when a person has been found out or caught and they will passionately plead their case? So Samuel said, and a lot of times, now folks will back down. Okay, I see the tears. I get it. But it says, so Samuel said, has the, has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices 
as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Right. You ever want to know where that verse comes from? We, we quote it a lot. It came from this situation. Basically, God was, had told Samuel, tell him this. If he's trying to be all sacrificial, here's the place for sacrifice. It does not come before obedience. Jesus even said in the New Testament, if you love me, obey me. He says, to obey, the, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. Watch this, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Amen. So right then, you ever know anybody that, that knew better but just was stubborn? Amen. The Bible says it's as iniquity and idolatry. And in the first commandment, God says, you will put no other gods before me. So when you're being stubborn about grabbing a hold of the truth that God's trying to prevent in your, pre present in your life, then your stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. He says, because you have rejected the word. Somebody say the word. The word. Of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. Doesn't say he's rejected you from ever having a relationship with him. Doesn't say he's rejected you from ever going to heaven. But he has rejected you from reigning in this life. You'll never reign with the Lord if you reject the word of the Lord. Can I say that again? You will never reign with the Lord if you reject the word of the Lord. You cannot, as a Christian, you have, it's a mighty big issue as a Christian if you've got a problem with what the Word of God says. I said on social media today, don't hate on your pastor because of what the Bible says. He didn't write it. He's just relaying the message. Can't help what it says. Can't help the truth behind it. I didn't write it, but I can tell you right now, I believe it. And I'll live the rest of my life living by it. Amen? And if it makes you mad because it doesn't let you live the lifestyle that you feel like you ought to be able to live. If you don't like it because it, it, it puts a damper on the things that you want to do for God and the things that you don't think you have to do for God. I can't help that. Don't kill the message. I didn't write the book. Amen? I'm just relaying the message. Hallelujah. Am I talking right, Pastor? Hell yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. All right, verse 24. Then Samuel said to Sam, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. Now he's telling the truth. Now he's coming clean. He's heard all this. He's done heard. He's committed witchcraft. Yeah. He's, got, he's got iniquity. He's, uh -huh. he's done idolatry. He, he, he's, he's not obeyed God. He's falling all to pieces now. And really, that's when God can do something with you. Right. He might not let you be where you were at, amen, but you can still be with Him. Yeah. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. He admits it. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words. Because, watch this. Here's the reason, everybody. You ready for the reason? Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He was the king. He was the leader. And instead of getting them straight, amen, he adhered to what they said. So we really don't have to kill all these. Look at it. Look at the shape that sheep is in right there. I need a sheep like that. Look at that oxen. Boy, I mean that oxen is strong. That oxen has got, he's a four-wheel drive oxen. I go mud with that oxen. Look at that cow. You know how much food we can get from that cow? Put in my cereal bowl every morning for a month at least. Off that one cow. Come on, so we got to keep these animals. And he adhered to the people and kept them. Then when this prophet came, found him out, confronted him, oh, we're about to sacrifice these animals. No, you won't. You're going to take them home. 
He said, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Verse 25. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to Saul, I will not return to you. For you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. It is up, Saul. You're done. You're done in this, okay? All right? And we know, we know, as far as the Bible says, Saul went to heaven when he died. How do you know that? Because Samuel came back from the dead and said, by this time tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Right? right? right. He said that. And, and so we're not talking about someone losing the relationship with God forever, but losing the ability to right. reign in this life. Right. Amen. And God don't want you to lose the ability to reign. He wants you to reign. Amen. He wants you to have a kingdom life. He wants you to live as kings and queens. Amen. And so with that said, he, he said, I have sinned. I've transgressed the commandment of the Lord. Verse 24 again. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Can I tell you my last teaching point? Teaching point number two. Watch this. You'll never rule your world as long as the need for approval from others rules yours. Yeah. That's good. You will never rule your world as long as you always feel you've got to be accepted and have the approval of other people. Can I tell you, obeying God is easy when everybody likes it. But obeying God is difficult when they don't like it. Obeying God is difficult when it's not popular in that situation. Obeying God is hard when they, they come against you. Amen? He had to have told, he should have told him, no, we're killing everything. No, no, no. He said, the Lord said he ah, has to kill man. everything. Don't get in my way or all, you're going to be, if you stand in the way of me obeying God. Saul could have said this. If you're standing in the way of me obeying God, then you have become my enemy. Come on, here. You become an enemy of God. And if you're an enemy of God, you are my enemy because I'm God's man. God put me where I am and I'm going to obey right. God. Amen? But instead, he had to hear the, their voice, and he was too worried about their approval. Therefore, he was no longer able to rule anymore. You'll never rule your world as long as the need for approval from others rules yours. It's easy to obey God when everybody likes it. Amen? Now, we're talking about, anybody get anything out of this tonight? I'm, almost, I'm, almost, I'm wrapping it up. Talking about taking your eyes off of God. That's what Saul did. He took his eyes off of God and got his eyes on himself. He took his eyes off of God and got his eyes on the people and what they wanted. With Samson in the book of Judges, he had taken his eyes off of the own, off of the one who had anointed him with supernatural strength. God did that for him. We've never heard of another human being like Samson ever. We've seen it in comic books and in movies and cartoons. But we've never known that there'd be a man. I know the world's strongest men competition, those guys are something. The things that they uh, and I know some guys that can bench press some pretty serious weight. But there's never been anybody that could kill a thousand men in one day with the jawbone of a donkey. When you do that, come talk to me. <laughs> we need to make a movie about you. When you can take foxes. Come on, and tie their tails together. <laughs> <laughs> then light a match to them yeah. and turn them loose in a wheat field and let them burn it down. You come talk to me. You are mighty strong when you can take foxtails and tie them together. Dwayne Johnson, I ain't never heard Dwayne Johnson do anything like that. I've never heard, come on, so I ain't never heard Hulk Hogan do anything like that. Amen. Samson was one bad dude and he got his eyes off the one who granted him that supernatural strength. So in the end, guess what he lost? He lost his eyes. The things that he took off of God, he lost them. When they seized Samson and he had lost his power, he lost his anointing, he lost his supernatural strength, the first thing they did was gouge out his eyes. Don't take your eyes off Jesus. He'd been demanding to his parents. He once told his mom and daddy one time, he says, I want that Philistine girl now. And he, have you ever read that scripture? How demanding he was to his mom and daddy. He won't honor his parents. He said, go get her for me. 
Wow. She looks good to me. That's what he said. She looks good to me, Daddy. Go get that girl right now. I can see me. <laughs> Coming home and telling Danny and Betty Sue, I done met a little girl in the Rocky Mountain. Her name is Tiffany. Mama and Daddy, y'all go get her from me. Why? Because she looks good to me. <laughs> he looked at me and said, Boy, go back to bed. You ain't leaving this house. He really did do that one time. We ain't going nowhere today. He was demanded to his parents. He used his might for revenge. And then he let lust overtake him to the point that he let his guard down and that was his downfall. He took his eyes off of the one who put him where he was at. He authors every breath we breathe. Amen? We don't need to take our eyes off of him. Life and the enemy want you to. Secular society wants you to. An antichrist influenced society and culture wants you to. Right? I mean, come on, somebody. We can't even watch a Super Bowl without a halftime show that's got a stripper pole and crotch grabbing with children watching. Now, we didn't have that here. We cut it off. That's right. But I mean, really, where have we come to? Amen? I vote for Chris Tomlin and Hillsong and Jesus Culture to do the halftime show next year. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So in closing, when it comes to the things that have caused us to take our eyes off of Jesus, how determined are we to put it in its proper place? You might not have to give it up. It's not detrimental if it's not dominating your life or, or, or you know, taking your life over and costing you and causing you all kinds of problems. But you may need to put it in its proper place because you don't need to let anything cause you to take your eyes off Jesus. Anybody get anything out of this teaching? I hope you enjoyed it. Stand to your feet tonight.